Hey, Chad, it's great to see you. How have you been? Pretty good. What have you been up to these oh, days? I've been working a crazy schedule at NBC. I've made a few guest appearances on Another World. It's been real well, that's busy. that's great. How about yourself? Well, I've been in jail. You've been in jail? Yeah. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. I hope things improve for you. Look, I'm in a real rush. i got to run. It All was right, great I'll seeing see you. Yeah, Bye -bye. I'll see you later. Yep. Mark, why didn't you tell him you were co-host of the program? Well, I was a little ashamed. Ashamed? Excuse me. I'm George Deronda and welcome to Primetime and what a power pack show we've slapped together for you this time on Primetime because coming up on the big show we have from Germany opera singer Mark Munkittrich. You know he's my cousin George. He's your cousin? Yeah. Is that where you get all of your great vocal ability? I don't think so. You, you do it all on your yeah, own I then? Yeah I do it all on my own. But, but let's, you know we got another problem. Look who we have running camera. A new intern. Oh, it's Chad. Chad all the way in from New York. He's running camera yeah, for us today. Yeah, I can today. see the show going downhill right now. Well, we won't have that problem because we're going to start off the big show with the entertainers and run around Sue. Let's go for a ride. Here's my story. It's sad but true. About a girl that I once knew. She took my love and ran around with every single guy in town. Does it believe me with a broken heart? Well, ask any girl what you would do. I keep away from a run of ice. If the window is right on my face, the man go back to the girl's warm embrace. Don't you know what a fly like do? I keep away from a run of ice. Hey, hey, what but I but I hey. Hey, 
line and run around zoo. Yes, that was the entertainers and run around zoo. And we'll be right back with opera singer Mark Munkittrick right after this. Hey, you know, he's my cousin. I know, we already talked about that. Gee, Piggy, what can we do to help the environment? Let's not waste electricity! What? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah! Uh, to find out what you can do to help, write to Make a Difference, National Wildlife Federation, Washington, D.C., 20036. Lights out! Ah! Give me! My next guest has traveled farther to be with us than any other guest before on prime time. All the way from Stuttgart, Germany, let's meet Mark Munkittrick. Well, Mark, welcome to prime time. It's a pleasure to have you here. I've never heard such a powerful voice other than my own. Thank you very much. But some of us speak louder than we sing. <laughs> it's true, too. Uh, singers try to save uh, their voices sometimes, so their speaking voices are very often much softer. Well, I'm a singer, but there's not much to save for. <laughs> Uh, now, I understand your career started in an unusual manner at Carnegie Hall. That was your first professional engagement? That's correct. Uh, before that time, I had been doing workshops and uh, actually working in the film business in New York City and uh, singing as a hobby. I started singing in high school. I went to high school in Ludlow, Massachusetts. You're originally from the area. Right, that's correct. I was born in Boston, but I was brought up in uh, western Massachusetts, mainly in Ludlow. Uh, it's true, my first professional engagement was at Carnegie Hall, which is quite a, quite a place to start. Quite I a mean, most people demo. find it lucky if they make it at Springfield Symphony Hall. Yeah, that's, that's true, which I've, I've also sung there uh, quite a while back. But no, uh, I had been singing most, uh, most of my life as a hobby. Uh, workshops in choruses in college. I went to Providence College in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, and in high school, I sang in high school. Uh, I was in the Peace Corps in Iran. Iran. Uh, Iran, right, in Persia. And uh, I also sang uh, as, as a hobby while I was there. So it wasn't really uh, an overnight thing. I had been uh, building and working on my, uh, my voice for quite a long time. But it was a very big, big, big break uh, just to jump into Carnegie Hall, like you say. An agent happened to hear me in, uh, in one of the workshops and invited me to, to sing a concert at Carnegie Hall with uh, a recording contract, uh, two records with Columbia Masterworks. And that's where I got my start. The next day, uh, I got a call after this uh, from the head of the New York City Opera, inviting me to sign a two-year contract there. And that's when I started to have serious doubts about continuing the film business. Well, what brought you all the way to Germany? Well, after the initial engagement at New York City Opera, uh, it's basically the way things happen. Another agent from West Germany heard me and uh, invited me to come and audition in West Germany uh, for a position there. Uh, at the time, I wanted to sing more German. I was very interested in singing Wagner, Wagnerian opera. And uh, I took the offer and I took the opportunity and I did go over and I auditioned. And uh, my first audition was in Karlsruhe. And uh, they immediately signed me for a, a long-term contract. And that's where I got my start in West Germany. Now, what are the basic differences between American opera and German opera? Oh, that's a good question. The, I think the, the most basic difference is uh, the subvention from the state. In Germany, you don't really have to worry about where your money is coming from. You don't have to worry about uh, pleasing the public. Uh, you don't have to worry about hiring and firing. It's, it's all paid by the taxpayers, unlike the states where uh, most of the funding is done by private corporations and uh, most of the opera companies here more or less go around begging for money and at the same time they have to really appeal 
their program has to appeal to the public here, which is obviously a very good thing. On the other side of the coin, though, you don't get a chance to, to experiment, to try things that might not be so popular with the public here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a great opportunity. It's a great opportunity for, for young singers and for young composers also that could never get their works performed here. Do you find that opera is more popular in Europe? It's much more popular, yes. We, uh, I think right now there's around 83 opera houses in West Germany alone, which is a very small country. Uh, in, in a comparison, I think there might be under 20 really recognized opera companies in the entire United States of America. Uh, in the European opera houses, you see an awful lot of young people that go to the opera. Now, of course, in this area, in western Massachusetts, there's not uh, much of an opportunity for that. Uh, not having an opera house or any kind of uh, uh, standing company that shows opera here, it's, it's very difficult. I mean, you've got Tanglewood, you've got other sources for uh, serious, let's call it serious music or classical music. Uh, but again, opera outside of maybe Boston, it gets pretty much shorted here. Oh, you mentioned performing at Springfield Symphony Hall. Right. Was that with a traveling company? No, that was uh, with uh, Robert Guder and the Springfield Symphony. We did uh, the Flying Dutchman here. This was quite a while. This is just before I went to Germany. It must have been about 10, 11 years ago. Now, what made you choose opera as opposed to most kids when they're in high school and their college years, they're listening to rock and roll? Mm -hmm. That's an interesting question. I, I think if I had a choice, I think this, the voice is what actually makes the decision for you. But uh, I, I did do a stint as a folk singer for a while, nothing professional. I mean, in the 60s and 70s, everybody's running around with guitars and singing, uh, mm -hmm. singing that type of music. Uh, but I think my voice uh, turned out to be something else. As far as background is concerned, I grew up in an atmosphere Although I grew up in Western Massachusetts, uh, I grew up in an atmosphere where there was a lot of classical music being played by my parents. So I was able to, I was exposed to it as, at a very early age. Uh, again, it would have probably been nice to have backed this up with an opera house or something where I could have gone to see it. That didn't come till much later. Uh, and I think when I did finally see opera and hear it on a, on a large scale, I was so impressed by it that I, I said, that's for me. And again, uh, the human voice is, has characteristics that some people are more, uh, more they have voices that are, that are better built to sing uh, rock and roll and voices that are more inclined to sing operatic or classical or heavier things. And some people have better voices to sing polkas. That's absolutely true. We need everything in this world, yeah. A, a big thing I think that, that you have to realize with, uh, there's one, basic difference obviously with singing opera and and singing rock or, or other types of music in that is that opera is not normally miked. You don't have microphones, you don't have the amplification that rock and roll bands have or that folk singers have and so it's a totally different kind of training. It's a training that you really have to project with nothing else there but your voice and it's not just projecting in, a, in an empty hall but uh, projecting sometimes over an orchestra that has over a hundred pieces in it and into an audience that has five or six thousand people. Now that's by rock standards that's probably a small audience, five or six thousand people, but you have to realize once For again, one voice to project to right. that amount of people over a complete orchestra. It's, it's a different story altogether, right. Now you've performed for many dignitaries. You performed for the Pope, I understand, and That's the right. King and Queen of Spain, to name a few. That's right. Yes, I've sung uh, within the past five or six years. I've sung all over South America, Italy, France, Spain. I recently did a tour in Moscow, Leningrad, and the entire East Blo Eastern Bloc countries. Uh, Dresden I was in Berlin, East Berlin, and uh, Warsaw. Yes, and uh, most of the heads of state normally come to opera, so uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's the thing they do. And uh, afterwards, there's usually a little ceremony uh, where, where you meet them. I had an audience with the Pope when I was at the Vatican. We sang a Beethoven Mass, and uh, we had a small audience with him after the concert. And again, when we were in Spain, uh, the Queen gave an audience for us, and it makes it very interesting. You've literally been all over the world. Just about, yeah, just about everywhere. 
and still coming back to Western Massachusetts. Well, I understand we have some pieces that we haven't quite prepared. This was kind of a last minute thing you consented to perform for us. And well, I am, am on vacation, George. And yeah, we, <laughs> we interrupted your vacation and we've taken an entire day out of your vacation for this interview. And we found John Siddard. He didn't have anything to do today, so he consented to come along. This was very nice. Of and uh, do the best he can. It was really a rehearsal for everyone. I think so. Yes, I think it's a good good way to put it. So keep that in mind while you're listening to these pieces. Uh, what are we going to listen to first? The first piece, uh, the first aria, operatic arias, are what they're called. They're actually mm -hmm. songs within a piece. Uh, the first piece is the Schweig aria, which, which means the, the quiet aria, which is, it's not, and I'll explain that in a minute, from uh, Karl Maria von Weber's Der Freischütz, which means the free shooter. And uh, this is a, I play a character in this opera named Kaspar, and he is uh, an instrument of the devil. It's a very evil person, and he uh, has made a pact with the devil that after a certain number of years, three years to be exact, uh, in order for him to remain the number one shooter, uh, he has basically sold his soul to the devil. But now his term is up, and uh, in order to remain living, among the living, he has to come up with another victim. So uh, he picks Max as his victim, uh, a boy from the village that's not very world wise, and he more or less tricks him. And as Max is going away, he says, don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone what we're doing. Schweig, the German word is Schweig, be quiet, and don't warn anyone. More or less, he's afraid that uh, Max is going to tell and uh, they're going to find out what, what Casper is doing. So this is, uh, we'll hear a, a small part of this aria from Der de, de Freischütz, von Karl Maria von Weber. <laughs> Damit dich niemand warnt. Schweige, damit dich niemand warnt. Der Hölle Welt hat dich umgarnt. Nichts kann vom tiefen Fall dich retten. Nichts kann vom tiefen Fall dich retten. Nichts, nichts kann dich retten vom tiefen Fall. Nichts, nichts kann vom tiefen Fall. Well, that sounded great also. That was a Thank German much, aria. Right. Uh, have you ever performed in Poland? Yes, I have, as a matter of fact. Uh, you know, we had Frank Knight on the program a few months back. I happened to see that and, a few weeks And ago. he had uh, a little Polish, he called it the Polish Opera Group. Uh -huh. I don't know if it was actually opera. Right. I, it, yeah, an op folk opera group, yes. No, I sang in, uh, just recently, as a matter of fact, uh, four or five months ago, in Warsaw, the very first version of the ring of Richard Wagner. Uh, this was a very big occurrence in that it hadn't been done since before World War II. The Polish feelings against the Germans naturally be ve being very strong negatively. And uh, so this was quite a, a, a big thing, the first ring in so many years. The ring is a very big production of, of four Richard Wagner operas that are usually done four nights in a row or four nights within a week or, or ten days. And that was quite a nice experience. I enjoyed it very much. When you're performing, are you usually performing almost every night of the week? No, no, no. Uh, it's, it's not really like that. The human voice, unfortunately, when you're not using microphones, uh, usually needs a, a day or two to, to recuperate. So you absolutely need the rest. You know? uh, it's different uh, if you're, of course, on a stage with a microphone and you can modulate your voice and not really have to give everything you've got. In opera, especially in Wagnerian opera or heavier opera, you really, it's almost like a, a sport. It's a, a physical discipline that you really have to give an awful lot of physical uh, strength. And uh, usually when it's over, you're, you're pretty much wiped out for a day or two. Uh, it does happen that you sing two or three nights in a row. Uh, it's not uncommon, but it's, it's not the rule. It's more the exception. 
So what's the next selection we're going to be hearing on our primetime opera hit parade? Well, I thought you might be getting a little tired of German. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have any Polish numbers with me, as you know. We, uh, Good thing. Frank Knight took care of that a few months back. <laughs> well, we sort of looked all over town. I, I, again, I'm on vacation, and I didn't have any music with me for our pianist. So uh, we sort of got what we could. So the next uh, two numbers, I'll, I'll capsulize, if I may, uh, will be done in Italian. And we can more or less put them together in that they are both very sad numbers. The first uh, aria is from La Boheme, from Puccini, and it's called Vecchia Zimarra. And it's, uh, it's going to sound very strange when I explain it to you, but it's about a man who is selling his coat to get money to save Mimi, who is dying from tuberculosis. Okay, that's a very, very capsulized version, and, uh, but accept it, okay, at that. And the second piece I'll be doing, which is also a very sad piece, concerns uh, Philip II of Spain and his son Don Carlo. And Don Carlo is the name of the opera from Giuseppe Verdi. And uh, it has to do with Philip's wife, who supposedly fell in love with Philip's son, this is a very strange thing. And in this aria, El la Jamai Mamo, he, he tells of his feelings and of the fact that this woman never loved him. And it's very sad. He, he sings, who is going to care for me in my old age? Who is going to look over me when I'm in my sepulcher, when I've died? And so they, like I say, they're very, very sad arias, the both of them. And they're in Italian. So here we go. Vecchia timora senti, io resto e viene tua scendere sacro monte ordevi. Le mie grazie ricevi, ma So a finir La aurora in bianca il mio dolor Già spunta il di Passar Le coie giornianti Io sono te Sparita mia Okay, that sounded great too. That was Italian. We've heard German and Italian operas. Well, I'm afraid you're going to hear German again. Uh, well, well, these are only excerpts. We have to explain to the people that true. there's a whole lot more. If we had to air the entire operas, we'd have to have a 12-hour primetime program. Well, not only that, it's it, they're excerpts of uh, because we didn't have very much time to rehearse. We were only able to do parts of the arias. So, uh, as an example, this last aria we just went through, the Ella Jamai Mamo, actually lasts about six minutes within itself. Uh, the next piece, as a matter of fact, we're going to hear is uh, from a mass written by Giuseppe Verdi, uh, the Verdi Requiem, and we will be hearing with full orchestra the bass aria, the bass solo from the Verdi Requiem.
overall, this is certainly a pleasant change for prime time. It's been very interesting for me, too, to come home and, and be able to do this. Other than the usual groups that we usually have on the program, Chet Dragon and his polkas, yeah, it's doesn't, doesn't, have, doesn't have quite the voice that you do, though. There's room for everyone. I'm <laughs> just, I listen to just about every kind of music I can. I really enjoy all kinds of music. So you do get into all different styles? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, as a matter of fact, when I, when I come home at night after a rehearsal, after a performance, Opera is the last thing I want to listen to. I'll, I'll put some blues on or some any popular music, whatever. But it's just like anything else. You know, you, you get probably get your fill of it at the you know, while you're working at it at the job, and you come home. You want something different. You're ready for something else, sure. Now, is there anything left in the future for Mark Munkittrick? Can can we look forward to seeing you in the area at well, some point in time in the future I performing? I haven't had any contact with the Springfield Symphony in quite a while, as a matter of fact, it's unfortunate, uh, but I've been quite busy in Europe. Uh, this year, I'll be singing all over Germany once again, and I have engagements in Italy and Spain at the moment, and that always gets to be more and more as time goes on. And uh, in early spring next year, I'll be here back in the States in Tulsa, and Omaha singing the magic flute, Die Zauberflöte, if you'll pardon my German, from, uh, written by uh, Wolfgang Mozart. And uh, I'll be looking forward to coming back and singing in the States once again. Well, thanks, Mark, once again for being here on Primetime. It has been a pleasure. George, it's been an absolute pleasure for me. Thank you very much for having me. And I hope to have you back again. Uh, maybe next time we won't be interrupting your vacation time, though. We'll plan it ahead of time next time. I hope so. We'll, we'll plan a few more performances. Fine. And stay with us. We'll be back with more prime time right after this. We pledged our allegiance to it when we were young. We studied its importance when we were in our teens. We sing its praises at every sporting event. We display it when we celebrate, lower it when we mourn, and honor our heroes with it when they've fallen. It stands for what we are and what we believe in. How we treat it says a lot about us. That just about wraps it up here for another prime time, and I'd like to thank all my guests, opera singer Mark Munkitcher, the entertainers, and Dora, and all the folks over here at the Connecticut Trolley Museum. And thank you for watching. Do join us again next time on Prime Time. Don't forget to vote. Good night, everybody.